Harvard Divinity School. Multiple Subjectivities and the Ethnographic Study of Lived Religion, April 26, 2023. My name is Giovanna Parmigiani, and I'm the host of this series organized within the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative at the CSWR here at Harvard Divinity School. This series focuses on ways of knowing that are often labeled as non-rational, traditionally referred to as gnosis in Western philosophical and religious traditions, and often understood in contraposition to science. These ways of knowing are becoming more and more influential in contemporary societies, popular culture, and academic research. What is the place of spirit possession, divination, and experiences perceived as out of the ordinary in our lives? How can we study and approach this type of phenomena? Going beyond dichotomies such as body and mind, ordinary and extraordinary, reason and experience, and matter and spirit. This series hosts scholars of different disciplines and practitioners interested in exploring and expanding the boundaries of what counts as knowledge today. This series is not conceived for a public of academics only. So students, students at heart, known experts, curious, perplexed even, you're all welcome here. So it is with immense honor and pleasure that I introduce you today the fabulous scholar and friend, Dr. Fadike Castor. Dr. Castor is a Black feminist ethnographer, an African diaspora studies scholar, with research and teaching interests in religion, race, performance, and the intersectional politics of decolonization. As a Yoruba Ifa initiate of Trinidadian heritage, they are inspired by African spiritual engagements with Black liberation in marginalities and the Black radical tradition. She is the author of Spiritual Citizenship, Transnational Pathways from Black Power to Ifa in Trinidad, published with Duke University Press and the recipient of the very prestigious Cliff, Clifford Greets Prize in 2018, which argued that centering the Ifa Orisha religion in the Black radical tradition and Trinidad's Black Power revolution illuminates decolonization practices and performances in the post-colonial Caribbean. Their writings can be found in cultural anthropology, fieldwork in religion, Tarka, and the Black Scholar. Her current research focuses on an exploration on, on how Black spiritual praxis draws from non-Christian religious and spiritual ontologies and epistemologies to shift our centers of being and ways of knowing towards collective care, healing, and social transformation. As part of this larger project called Digital Ancestral Altars, Remembrances of Trinidad Ifaurisha Elders, founded by a community story grant from the Crossroad Project at Princeton University, they will create a digital multimodal repository and archive to commemorate Trinidad's ancestral Ifaurisha Elders. Currently, she is an assistant professor of religion and Africana studies at Northeastern University and a visiting scholar here at the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard Divinity School. So welcome, Fadike. I'm so happy that you could be here with us. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Parmigiani, for having me. And I would like to thank the Center for the Study of World Religions and all the organizers behind the scenes who are helping to support this event here today. I'm so happy to be here for this conversation and so excited um, for our, our topic. Wonderful, so am I, I have to say. So let's start from a backstory. The audience mm -hmm. of Gnosiologies knows that I am very always interested in backstories. So differently from other scholars who've been here in Gnosiology space, you are very straightforward in sharing with your readership some of your personal engagement with your research, like, for example, in the preface of the book. And I have an excerpt that I could read, but it's way better if you can tell us maybe the story, how you got interested and involved in what you are currently and studying and, you know, studying in the past. How did you come into, come into academia? I came into academia um, through spirit through the ancestors, 
um, and through my engagement with Yoruba spiritual practices, um, I was in Oakland, California, and I was a cashier at a, a, a pagan bookstore. And I had an interaction with Oshun that actually starts um, the preface of the book starts with her, her words, her voice, and it's four words, save her, she's mine. And the finger is very important because it, it comes with this finger and people have had interactions with Oshun. They know her look and her, and her finger, right? So it's a different type of energy. And that started me on the pathway to the Arisha um, tradition and to being in spiritual community. And um, in the spiritual community I joined, the first thing they did as you um, started to be considered a possible member of the spiritual community is they had you go to a class on, on the ancestors and on venerating the ancestors and setting up your first ancestor, ancestor shrine. So the um, Oshun and the ancestors were my um, introduction to Yoruba religion. And then I had um, also a first Ifar reading. And I tell that story in the introduction. And um, in that Ifar reading, the Babalawo told me that Ogun would be very important to me. And I, when he said it, I had no idea who or what Ogun was. Um, and Ogun is the spirit of iron and innovation and settlement and war warriorship. Um, and also in some realms, kingship. Um, and so those three energies, Orisha, those three energies of the Orisha religion, the ancestors, Ogun and Oshun, have stayed with me constantly um, for the past several decades um, and guided me. And the long story, the short version of the long story is the ancestors sent me to graduate school. Um, in a sense, to study the, to study the ancestral practices of the Yoruba people and its impact in the diaspora. Um, and I went to the University of Chicago and got a PhD in cultural anthropology, um, literally at their behest. Um, does that wonderful? I can go so, on, but <laughs> no, no, of course. And I'm happy, you know, if you want to share anything else about this, I'm happy to uh, to hear it. But um, so you say actually very adamantly in the introduction in the preface that. Differently from people like me, who, you know, anthropologists who went on the field and then felt somehow called, uh, you actually were sent on the field, were sent into academia by the spirits, right? Uh, do you think that this changed the way you approach your academic study and how? Yes, I think it changed, it changed the way, you know, I understood, I, it changed the way that I engaged theory. Right, and their um, our first year of, of graduate training is on what in at Chicago is on Western social theory, mm -hmm. and there is a, a presumption that that Western social theory is your center, but that Western social theory was not my center, and you know my initial evaluations noted that I had an uneasy um, relationship to theoretical discourse. And yes, it was uneasy to me because it felt hostile because it, it was the theoretical discourse that informed a system that said that people like me were not supposed to be in rooms like that, learning that, getting this degree, right? So it was a system that negated the humanity of black people. So yes, I had an uneasy relationship to it. So, um, you know, my family is Trinidadian. So I say that I have Trini roots um, and, and US wings in a sense, in which I've had opportunities that you get through being in the States. But I'm very clear that my roots are diasporic, my roots are Caribbean, my roots are Trinidadian. And those are the two pillars, the Trinidadian roots and the grounding in spirit that kept me anchored in um, resisting the centering of my thinking in Western epistemologies. 
Wonderful. And talking about your roots, um, today we are here to talk about multiple subjectivities, and in particular about an article that you wrote entitled mm -hmm. Subjectivity Offerings from African Diasporic Religious Ethnography. And I, well, it, it's it's very interesting for a number of reasons, including the you know the the right the beginning and we we're gonna talk about that in a minute but also because you write the whole article with using the pronouns i we which i found extremely potent uh and i have two quotes just to let the audience just you know get into the feel of the article i we propose an exploration of subjectivity where ethnographic approaches to the study of religion Express the religious expressions raise questions of our relation to each other and to the divine, and indeed if they are separate at all. And the other quote is that one implication of multiple subjectivities is the need to take up decolonizing anthropology calls to decenter the researcher and their gaze as a singular subject, thus breaking down the ethnographic power relation that objectifies the people and communities. We work with. So, what do you mean by multiple subjectivities? Do you want to tell us the story about Oshun driving? Um, yes. So, let us know about you know how this article came to be. All right. So, um, I was talking recently with somebody about those friction points, those points of interaction as you're doing research in your communities with the people that you've developed relationships where, with, where something happens that moves beyond your understanding. And while you may seem confused or perplexed, maybe the people around with you, with you are like, this is every day, this is quotidian, this is just normal, normal, right? And so these points stick with me and I often will ruminate on them over time. And one such point was, um, became a story that I used to open the article called Ocean Drives. I had mentioned it in passing in the book, but I hadn't elaborated it because I hadn't worked out that, that friction, right? That tension um, between what happened and my understanding or lack of understanding of what happened. So when the opportunity to write an article um, on subjectivity came, um, and this came out of a panel on, um, on critical concepts in anthropology or ethnography of religion at AAR, the American Academy of Religions. And um, I wanna thank the organizers for putting together that panel and giving me an opportunity to think through this sticky point. So, uh, let's set the stage first for the sticky point. So I am, I work, um, my research was in Trinidad um, over two decades. And I worked in many places in Trinidad, but one of my primary places where I did um, research and where I was located was Ile Eko um, Chango Ati Malosha, the um, shrine that we call Isam in the back of the Santa Cruz Valley. So important for the story is that it is a bit off the beaten track, right? So it's in a valley and then off to um, at the base of some foothills. And I was there as they got ready to do a conference. And I was there to see um, a friend, to find a friend that I hadn't seen in a long time. And so as I um, waited for my friend, I was paying attention to all the ongoings and I was especially paying attention to the cars that were coming. And this car pulls up and has dark tinted windows. And I'm like, is he in there? Is he in there? And um, nobody moves. Like usually when a car pulls up, the doors open, people get out. There was this pause and I was like, what, what's going on? And then the door opened and somebody called my name, Barike, come here. And it was my spiritual godmother, Ia Shango Wumi, Shango Disawanda, the leader of the shrine. 
um, Ibae, who um, just made transitions to the spiritual realm um, about 27 days ago now. So we remember her and call her name as she makes her journey into the ancestral realm. And we're going to see her in a little video clip that I'm going to show. So she gets out and she asked me to help her um, to stand. And, you know, she's a bit unsteady on her feet because she seems to be both here and there, right? Not fully present. She seems to be somewhat traveling and engaged. Um, there's a, an energy coming off of her. And it, it, it makes me aware. And come to find out when I make an inquiry about who's in the car, what she tells me is the reason for the friction. She says, is Oshun there? Is Oshun driving? And at that moment, it hit my brain. What? Wait, what did she say? Did she say Oshun driving? And then the car door opened and I see a figure get out. And my social scientist brain wants to classify it as a person on the shrine with a name. And I look at that person and I look at their face when they turn. And I realize it's not that person. It is indeed Oshun. While the person was driving from the airport with um, somebody who they went to pick up, who was a sacred eminent person, the ashe in the car over called spirit and Oshun manifested as a, um, so a manifestation is the Trinidad term for possession, right? So um, that per the driver became possessed by Oshun. And Oshun finished the drive into the hills, down the dirt road. And um, so let me show a little video clip. Um, and just, I'm gonna show 30 seconds. So I was caught off guard and I wasn't recording when Oshun came out of the car. So this video is uh, about a minute or two after um, Oshun had gotten out of the car. But you'll see the car on the left and you'll see Oshun in white on um, the other side. And maybe you have to remember uh, to remind to the audience that Oshun is the Orisha of creativity, sweet water, femininity, right? So as a spirit, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I love, I love how the, the girl went and how. Yes. She went straight to Oshun, right? Yeah. And she, she knew Oshun. She recognized Oshun, right? And Oshun is also, um, people pray to Oshun for children, right? And she provides, um, where Yam, the Orisha Yamaya of the ocean is known as the uh, mother who raises the children, it's Oshun who conceives um, in her role as creatrix. So Oshun is the source of all creativity and potentiality. So Oshun um, gives the boon to women of um, conception and fertility to all people with wombs um, who want to bear children. Um, and she does, and she looks after children in a, in a very special way. So that friction point um, of Oshun driving is what um, generated this article that we are referencing on multiple subjectivities. Because it made me realize that there was, that I had an limit on how I thought about Orisha and the divine and spirit 
as active agents in the world. It had never crossed, I was used to seeing them in ritual. I had been seeing possession for over 10 years, personally and in my research, but I always saw them um, within a, a ritual frame. I had seen them do healing work. So it wasn't that I didn't think of Arisha as having autonomy. I just did not think of Arisha as having embodied agency with skills for things that are difficult, like driving, right? And trying to um, think through that puzzle led me to thinking about multiple subjectivities, led me to think about what does it mean, right, for our methodologies, our theories, our politics, and our ways of living together in community if we are to center spirit and the earth as we organize to unify, recognizing our diversity as a character of our singularity, but not as the central component of the singularity. And so I offered that it would mean taking seriously that the consideration that it is in other realms than those immediately apparent to the quote unquote Western gaze, perhaps in the spiritual realm, that freedom codes, ways of being and relating that are non-dependent on the European individuated quote unquote rational political subject of the state, right? That are not dependent upon that. that that is where the answer lies, is moving beyond a singular subject, moving beyond singularity as a point of departure. And in fact, embracing multiplicities. So, um, and when you think about decentering the I and recognizing that within me, um, when you're speaking with me, you're speaking with, yes, Fadike, the self that is Fadike, but you're also speaking with other selves, other subjects. So you're speaking with Ifa, you're speaking with Obatala, you're speaking with Oshun, you're speaking with Egbe, you're speaking with Ogun, right? So these are the ashes that I carry within me um, that allow for that multiplicity of divine presence to be um, shared. So both disembodied, multiply bodied, and embodied, depending upon the temporal moment. Does, it, does that? Yes, I think we have to unpack a little bit. Uh, I think sure. the potential, and I, I, I'm sure that the students in my students in the audience um, know why this is so important for so many reasons, also for, for them, for the study of religion today. Um, first of all, thank you for um, stressing how real and existent are not synonyms. We often you know, assume that are always synonyms, but there are instances like this one in which it's evident that they're not. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important starting point, I think, of the conversation, the, really setting the stage for all the development of the argument that you um, elaborate in, with in, in your article. Um, but what are the consequences, ethnographic consequences, for anthropology, for ethnography, of assuming a polyvocal subjectivity, um, multiple subjectivity as the subject? Um, of anthropology and the object of ethnography. Mm -hmm. So I think that one of the immediate consequences is um, an increased capacity to um, share the worlds of the people that you're in community with, right? So I realized that my attachment to a singular subjectivity was blocking me from um, seeing the full richness and scope, right? The full um, vernacular theorization 
the full ways that people not only lived their lives, but thought about their lives and were in relationship, not only with each other, but in relationship with the divine in a very active way, in an ongoing way, right? So I, it was like I was in a room, but I wasn't hearing all the uh, participants in the conversation. It's as if I had selectively muted certain voices. And once I embraced um, uh, polyvocality as right and a multiplicity of subjectivity, it allowed for me to hear more voices, um, literally, um, in the room, and that my and um, understand better um, the fullness that my community was engaged with, and that they were engaged in. Um, in multiple realms simultaneously. So that they were moving between the everyday, you know, going to the store, getting something, but as they were going to the store, you know, Oshun was saying, oh, pick up some of this for me. I would like some of this, right? So it was impacting and informing how they moved in the world. Um, does that, I'm so, so happy, yes, that you brought up the ordinary, everyday dimension of this, because I think yes. it's often um, not treated with due consideration and respect. Well, it's central in, in the experience of the people and of, of us ethnographers. Of, of so uh, thank you for pointing this out. Is your relationship with your Orishas... Um, informing also your work, how you do your work, what you see, um, how you are an ethnographer, how you are an anthropologist, how you write articles. Yes, yes. And, you know, um, M. Jackie Alexander, who is one of my favorite um, writers and thinkers and theorists in Pedagogies of Crossing in a section called Pedagogies of the Sacred, which I highly recommend. Um, she talks about writing blocks as spiritual issues, right? Because- um, Can you, you repeat? I missed writing blocks as? Spiritual issues, right? Writing blocks as spiritual issues because when we're writing, we are engaging with self and we are engaging in with all of our, with all selves, right? And if you have blocks, your access to all the many selves that are within you, then you don't really have the access to do the communication and to do the translation work that communication demands, right? Um, so it's been really a blessing for me to think about that because writing this way is very, has been challenging. I won't say that it's an easy path. Like it has been very difficult. It's not necessarily the way that I was trained to write. I was trained to write from a singular objective stance, which is I went, I saw, I know, <laughs> right? This is, I went there, I saw this, and now I know this. But instead what's happening is that spirit is asking me questions. Spirit is pushing me to, um, say what happens, um, what would happen in our writing, in our academic knowledge production, if we were to cite spirit, if we were to give credit to the voices that are informing our knowledge and are shaping our world. So that's an article that I'm working on right now. And I, my, my interlocutor for this piece is um, uh, of Orisha of, of writing from Ile Ife, known Oluorobo, right? So it's not a very widely known Orisha, uh, but Oluorobo was the first scribe for the first Urumole, which was the first Orisha in um, Yoruba cosmology in their, um, or in their origin story, who came, who were on earth. And he would go to their meetings, take notes and go to a report the notes to Oludumare, which is, you know, um, let's say an all seeing, all knowing, but more remote um, divine force 
that often gets translated as God. It's not the only God. So, um, so I am working with Oluwodoropo in doing this article, but that means that it takes unexpected turns and it means that I have to um, sometimes be willing to move aside my ego and step aside from anxiety and self-doubt and trust, right? And trust um, that this engagement with spirit is um, producing a form of knowledge that is going to resonate and that is going to speak to how people live in the world, right? So I come from a, a lived religions perspective where we are really looking not just at what the theory says, but what are people doing, right? And how is that shaping the world? And that it is going to also um, perhaps offer some new ways of thinking. Going back to at the beginning, I asked that question about freedom codes, right? Um, looking at maroon codes um, at, at, a, at a spiritual level. What would it take for us to construct an otherwise world that so many of us say that we want? And what would it take for us to move into that world? And for me, that the answer for that comes through a serious um, engagement, theoretically, with spirit. Thank you so, so, so much for sharing this. I think it's a space of vulnerability that you shared with us. And you also mentioned a preface. And it's a vulnerability is very important to me as well in my ethnographic practices. And I am often asked by students, are you a scholar practitioner? Which is actually a definition that I don't fully um like, at least in my case, I'm an ethnographer. And of course, all of me is in my work, right? In my ethnographic practice and in my anthropological um, uh, research. So I'm a practitioner and I'm a scholar. And of course, some of my writing practices, some of the things I'm attracted to in the field are guided by my own practice, by my own spirit. So I don't work with Orishas, but I, I am, um, because this is part of me. This is the filter that I use. It's part of me. And this is the richness of ethnography and probably it's limitation also. But um, so thank you for sharing this. I am very much um, having a similar uh, approach to ethnography that it's not very common, I have to say, uh, more and more so. But um, thank you for sharing this. We have a question from the audience. I'm curious to understand more about how the speaker discerns that the voices are from spirit. Hmm. That's an interesting question. And I would say that that question comes from experience, right? So I have been um, in the Yoruba um, tradition um, um, and I, you know, you hear me hesitating because I'm considering using the term religion and I am um, shying away from using the term religion, uh, not because um, the Yoruba tradition isn't as fully formed as um, most Americans think of when they think of the category religion, which they usually um, relate to Christianity but because it's more formed, it's, it's beyond, it's, um, it's greater than the limits of the term religion because it is also a, a way of life, a way of being, and it's also a philosophy. It's also a moral and ethical system, which exists, yes, within religions, but it's not um, constrained to um, certain practices, right? It is all encompassing. So it's holistic in that sense. It's also a healing system. It also contains within the corpus of Ifa uh, 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 um, history, right? A pharmacopoeia, et cetera. So, and also um, the, the Yoruba Indinjing 
the 30 million Yoruba speaking people, many of them traditional, what they call traditionalist, which is the term um, that is used within the community, um, primarily in Nigeria, even though this is a community that spans um, many nations, um, also make a discernment between codified religion. So I say that to say that experience is one way to know. The other way to know is training. And the third way to know is at that intersection of experience and training. So without getting too technical, in my initiations, when I was initiated, I was introduced um, to that energy and given the um, resources, the spiritual resources to access that energy. And it's sort of like the of being able to know the differences between the notes of a bell. So when you're introduced, you um, feel the resonance and the timber of that particular energy. And so you know that energy um, when it speaks to you. Wonderful metaphor. I will use it. <laughs> I will quote you. <laughs> That's, I think it's uh, wonderful. So we have another question by Marcelit, who was also a, a guest speaker in this series. Marcelit Faya, this is wonderful. Thank you. Do you think multiple subjectivities only apply to people who are initiated and who hold the energy of the Risha or any practitioner or spiritual person? I, I, that's a question that I have been thinking with, and I don't have a definitive answer. I have the start of an answer. And my start of the answer is that everybody has access to their ancestors, right? And both, you know, we talked about family as being given and chosen. And I would like to think about ancestors that way as being given and chosen, right? So I never met Audrey Lord, but I work with her in her, in her writing, in her work, and I walk with her in her spirit. And um, I would call Audrey Lord an affinity ancestor, right? And now this is stepping outside of um, sort of the orthodoxy of um, Ashesha Lakba, right? But this also comes informed by both a black feminist and a diasporic perspective um, in terms of having affinity ancestors. But we all have the ancestors of um, our progenitors, of the people who we came from and the people who raised us, right? I mean, I'm including um, people who are adopted, who were raised by people that were not their blood relatives, right? I don't wanna essentialize um, blood kinship. There are many very different forms of kinship, right? But part, from a Yoruba perspective, part of the kinship of care is, is relations of care. And those relations of care go back generations. And you don't need to be initiated to have access to those energies because those energies are literally relations of care that care about you and the, and your, the work that you do, not work in terms of job, but work in terms of um, the divine labor that, that you were tasked with um, in this incarnation. Does that make sense? I gave more of a spiritual answer than an academic answer, I hope that's okay. Hannah, I, um, I would like to add, since you mentioned the ancestor, the beautiful dedication of your book. You wrote, this book is for all those who came before, who paved the way, whose footsteps I walk in and shoulders I stand on. This is for you. Mo dupe lopo lopo. I think it was so beautiful. Sorry for my pronunciation, but you know, I didn't. Just, but um, I think this is so, so, so beautiful. So thank you. Thank you for, um, for this. I have a question for you, thinking about scholar practitioners and inhabiting mm -hmm. the academic space in this original way. Um, so how was it first? Did it change? What do you think this positionality, how do you think it changes ethnographic practices? Uh, do you have any consideration and thoughts to share with us? 
Um, it was difficult at first, you know, leaving Oakland, California, and moving to Hyde Park, Chicago, and leaving a spiritual community and moving to an academic um, community. Um, and 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 I, I pause there because I feel like those were two different two different resonances of the word community, right? Um, was difficult, and um, but at the same time, I felt well. First of all, I was trusting the ancestors. They told me to do this, so I was doing this. I wanted to leave at one point, and I went to them for permission because I was there at their mandate. And they were like, no, you can't go. You have to stay. And I was like, what do you mean? I want to go back to California. They're like, no, you have to stay. You have to finish. And so we had a conversation where I asked them to, if they were going to make me stay, to work it out. <laughs> work out some of the difficulties I was having. So they helped, they, they helped work it out. And it was, um, it was when I... Um, got funding, I got a, a Fulbright and a Winogrand um, dissertation research award to go to Trinidad to do research. Um, and I wasn't only researching Yoruba religion in Trinidad, which the book comes out of. I was really, um, the dissertation was turned out to be on Afro-Trinidadian cultural citizenship in different forms. So looking at carnival and emancipation. Uh, it was when I got to Trinidad that I realized what the ancestors were up to. That they had provided me um, access to the tools and resources that I needed to um, return home and to engage home at multiple levels. So the multiplicity that I'm talking about isn't just subjectivity, it's a multiplicity of the registers of knowledge production. So, you know, De Soto and Bordeaux helped me to understand what I was seeing in Trinidad, right? Um, it's not that I don't theoretically engage with um, scholars that come out of um, a, a Western modernity and um, the training. I have, you just, I'm pointing to like six feet of books, <laughs> right? That I'm currently engaged with. And part of being academic is being in dialogue. So I feel like there's a liminality that I occupy, which is betwixt and between. I'm an American Trini, right? Um, I am, um, and I'm, yes, I'm also an easy with scholar practitioner because it has within its construct um, an acceptance and reproduction of a bicameral construction right, that juxtaposes the two as if they're not um, synonymous, as if they can't occupy the same space, right? So yes, I bring all of me to my work. Um, so the short version to answer your question, um, Dr. Primergiana, is that it's something that I've matured into. And I would say that it's taken my work to interesting places and it's taking my writing to interesting places and it has informed perhaps a rhythm of my scholarly progress and my academic progress that may on the outside look different than other people's rhythms. But my rhythm isn't only beholden to um, Western productivity um, dynamics and, and, and measures, right? My rhythm is also beholden to the spiritual realms that I work within and to the um, charge that I was given um, in, this, in, in this lifetime. Thanks a lot. I, I like always when people challenge neoliberal assumptions about how we should um, handle our time. I just want to mention, since I'm a scholar of magic, that um, I would refer to mainstream Western modernity because there were many and some of them yes. did not imply <laughs> this yes. relationship with yes. us and with spirit. Can I say yes? Can I say yes to that? And I was recently engaging um, a Sylvia Winter artic article that she wrote in 1977 called We Know we are Where We Are From, The Politics of Black Culture from Mayel to Marley. 
So she is referencing here Mayaism, which is um, uh, Jamaican, Ar indigenous, African, Jamaican, religious expression. And then many of us know Bob Marley's work. Uh, but in the, in the article, she's doing all the things that I just mentioned. She's bringing in Western theorists. She's talking about Wallerstein. She's talking about um, Baudrillard. She's bringing in um, Jamaican cultural production. And then, um, Giovanna, what did she bring in? She brought in the, the Gnostics, right? And, and to make her point, and her point was very much that this, um, counter to Christianity that came up at the same time that Christianity was coming up. The Gnostic tradition offered, right, a counter symbolic order mm -hmm. in much the same way that, that Maya and Marley do. So yes. Yeah, wonderful. I think, wonderful. That, I think that's so important for us to remember. And I think your work is so important for that very reason. And I, can I use this moment to say that I'm so looking forward to your book that is coming out? <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's going to come out in the fall, finger crossed. <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, tell us, tell so us the title. So, the Spider Dance with Equinox. Spider Fabio. Dance. Everybody look out for it. <laughs> we all need. Thanks a lot, Fadike. That's so nice of you. Um, there's only 10 minutes left. I'm sorry because I would love for this conversation to go on for two hours or so, but um, I'm very invested in uh, my students' projects. And so I have different students who are interested in the possibility of inhabiting the ethnographic space and doing ethnography off and with spirits. Um, so what would be your suggestion, advice, um watch out you know tips uh for students or scholars interested in pushing a similar research um do you have any tip to share with us and with um our students yeah yeah you know you know i, I will i'll give you the um charge that my one of my readers gave me in um in the reports on the first version of the book. They said, be bold, Fadike. You have earned it. I share that with you and your students as a gift. Be bold. You have earned it. By virtue of your engagements, you have earned it. And what does being bold mean? Being bold means to sit with your own truth and be willing to communicate that truth. Now here's an issue, which I think we can all agree with, is that English is a very limited language. And that we are thinking in concepts that are beyond what is easily communicable in the English language, which is why I think some academic writing is so dense, it is so difficult to work through. Somebody in a recent conversation I was in was like, why do they have to write like that? <laughs> and we write like that because we're trying to write against and through and with, we're trying to push the language. And I wanna, you know, um, give the concept of, of the break and um, language being broken. So there's a notion of language being broken and being broken apart, right? And in breaking the language um, um, and, and pushing it. So what I did in that article was experimental. I don't write everything that I write in I slash we as a compound. It was a short article because I think it can be hard to read over a, a period of time, but I was doing it as, a, as, a, as an argument, as a part of the polemic. And I was also doing it to bring very present with the reader to, to ask them to think about the voice they were hearing as being in multiple registers and as having multiple subjectivities. But take, take chances like that. Um, look at the work of people like Alexis Pauline Gums, right? 
her writing has been inspirational to me because she breaks with tradition. She breaks with form in the structure, not only of her narrative and her poetry, but how she structures her books, right? So think, um, be, look to beyond works, words. Look beyond um, disciplines like anthropology and religious studies. Look at performance studies. Look at embodied knowledge, right? When I get stuck, I go to the spirit or I go to my body. The body knows. The body is a knowledge producer, right? And so the body, the body can express. And so look to creative forms of expression. And even if you don't think of yourself as an artist, if you are a thinker, you're an artist, right? So um, does um, Dr. Parmigiani, is Giovanna, is that what you're thinking of? It's it's amazing. Thank you. And I actually wrote down, be bold, you earn it. <laughs> and I will, will write it on my, on my plan or on my agenda. So I want to mention briefly, because I think it's... Um, it's a direct consequence of, of you taking the chance of being bold. Um, Bettina Schmidt, who is a very renowned um, anthropologist, uh, you, basically you wrote about your book. The book does not reveal any secret, sacred knowledge of the Ifauri Shine Trinidad, but keeps the focus on the author's personal journey and her reflection of knowledge and events that are in the public scene. It will become a great example of a new kind of anthropology that decolonizes not only knowledge, but also fieldwork methods that are at the heart of anthropology. And I have, you know, goosebumps when I read this, mm -hmm. because I think that um, she, she recognized the potential, really transformative, revolutionary potential of your work, also in terms of decolonization practices. So do you want to add something about this very important dimension of your work, past, current, and future? Um, I want to thank um, the reviewer for, for reading um, between the lines in some cases and, and really understanding um, part of what I was doing, uh, trying to do in that book. You know, a first book is always difficult. A first ethnography, doubly so, um, I think. Um, and so you're, you're both, this goes to your question that your students were asking about how do you do the work, but do it in a, in a, innovative, in, in an innovative way, in a do it a way that's true to yourself, but you have these structures, right? So a book has structures, a book is by nature linear. And if I, the, um, we haven't talked about temporalities, but my work is also engaging in a multiplicity of temporality and temporalities, which includes um, embracing nonlinear temporalities. So if you're working on nonlinear temporalities, then how do you write a straight narrative? A straight ethnography. How do you um, position if the uh, the standard um, ethnographic frame suggests that you situate yourself and then um, move yourself out of the frame and focus on the people um, in the community that you worked with, which I think is a wonderful thing to do. But what happens when um, your presence changes the dynamics of what you're looking at. Then you have to be attentive to the fact that at that point, you have to move yourself back into the frame because your very presence changed the situation and changed the understanding of the situation. And so I think that that collapsing of the um, subjective objective divide right, is part of um, something that's really important to do in um, anthropological practices, ethnographic practices that take seriously the calls from Black feminist um, ethnography, from queer ethnography, from indigenous ethnography, from decolonizing ethnographic methods that we, um, 
pay attention both to the very material relations of power that are that are growing on in the field and at the same time that we avoid centering the work on ourselves, right? This is not an ethnography of my navel. So, right, not doing navel gazing, but at the same time, we have a rich both and perspective where you're able to situate yourself in the field, in relationship and in kinship with the people that you work with, that you're not an absent other. Right, and at the same time, you're not othering them, you're not also not othering yourself. So, um, and I think that um, storytelling practices are really integral to um, these methodologies and something to be attentive to, right? Um, and I'm cognizant of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Fadika. There's a, there are many questions that unfortunately I cannot, um, we don't have time to um, to consider. I hope we can able to copy them and send them over to you to us. And again, if you want to reach out um, to us, please um, send me an email after the event uh, and I will forward in your email to Professor Castor. Um, it's time to wrap up uh, now. So thank you very much, Dr. Castor, Fadike, for your participation and wonderful conversation here. And thank you all for having been with us. Please stay tuned on the activities of the CSWR, the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative of Nauseologies. You can find all this information in the CSWR website um, and in the chat box, including, very importantly, new episodes of a new podcast that my colleague Matt Dillon hosts called Pop Apocalypse. So you can find information in the chat box. Please stay tuned. Thank you for having been with us. I hope to see you all next year with a new season of the Nosiology series. And I wish you, Fadike, and all um, a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody who um, came and participated in real time or you're watching this recording after the fact. Thank you for the center for having me. And special thanks to Dr. Giovanna Parmigiani for organizing this and being such a wonderful um, dialogue partner. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2023, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.